We test our assumption too. And so we learned uh, the quick way, which is a plot a graph, right? We call it a residual analysis to see uh, U hat over Y hat to see the variation of U hat if it is always a constant variation. Right. So if you find any patterns uh, different from such a constant band, so then it's a signal, probably assumption to constant variance. We call it homoscedasticity, right? Like it, it, it's, uh, it, it will be violated. Uh, this is informal because uh, different people might, I think, uh, graph uh, for different opinions. So that will be a formal way, which is a BP test. The BP test, the formal, formal name is a uh, Broch Pagan test. And brush again. They suggest uh, uh, such a test so that uh, based on the BP test result, based on the BP test result, something like this. So, for example, computer give us p value 0 0.037, so that we can directly jump to the p value. If p value less than 0 0.05, for example, in our case, we reject the null. We reject each null, just like a t test, just like a f test, and uh, you know. Whenever p value less than 0 0.05, we reject it now, right? So what's the h now, h1, you know, h h now h1 for our BP test? H now, the nice case, h now is uh, the variance is a constant sigma square. H1, you know, h1 is uh, the variance is a sigma square i, varies by i, right? Not a constant anymore. In other words, h now constant variance, we call this homo, homo scatastasticity. H1 varies by i, not constant anymore, varies by i, right? So we call it heteroscedasticity. Hetero means different. Homo means the same. Hetero means di different, right? So in, in our example, since we reject the null, our H null is homo. We reject the null. We are in the case of hetero, right? So that we know, for example, in this regression, our assumption two has been violated, right? Actually, from the residual analysis, from the plot, we also find a similar pattern, right? So that, um, so that uh, uh, based on our regression, we know our all of beta hat is still correct, but the variance will be too large, right? So issue number three, if our assumption two has been violated, then what's the solution, right? So we know, uh, first of all, what's the big deal of uh, something to what's the big deal of uh, inefficiency? Inefficiency means our go back to our all or less. This is all or less. The first column, all those uh, coefficients, these are the first column, they are all correct. But starting from the second column, this is a wrong. For example, standard error. Standard errors will be square root of variance, right? You know, if our assumption too violated, the variance will be too large, right? So if variance too large, standard error, which is square root of variance, will be too large. The second column will be too large. If second column is too large, the third column will be too small because third column, T ratio is first one divided by second one, right? The second column, they are the denominator. If the second column is too large, the T ratio will be that be too small, right? That's why, for example, this guy, this number, this is less than 1.96, right? So that you, you got to, based on the conclusion right here, we got number T ratio less than 1.96. So that your conclusion will be, okay, this guy, you know, uh, this number probably not, the coefficient basically zero. So that feel free to omit this variable, right? So that eventually you're gonna see this is an incorrect conclusion. And so, but let's finish this one. So that, you know, if uh, assumption number two violated, standard error, too small, so uh, too large. So that T ratio, too small, and a P value, too large, right? Larger than 0 0.05. Again, T value is too small. P value will be also too large, right? <laughs> so that no matter based on T ratio or based on P value, so that you got a conclusion, okay, we fail to reject now. For example, we don't see any stars afterwards, right? So that you run to the conclusion that, you know, we fail to reject the zero coefficient for, for this number, right? So that uh, you might run into the conclusion, okay, LNY doesn't affect LNC. LNY is a log income, people's income. LNC is slow consumption. So you, you get to the conclusion, okay, people's uh, 
uh, consum people's uh, individuals' uh, income doesn't affect you know into their consumption of uh, cigarettes, right? So this is based on all of this, basically. Later on, I'll show you. You run into a wrong conclusion, you know, for your t test, right? Uh, so the solution. So how do we recover the truth? The solution issue number three is uh, vigorous. Uh, is it? Uh, we suggest uh, a GLS. There is uh, right here. GLS. It's in different steps. Actually, three steps. First step. Based on all or less residual you had, we square it. Square the all or less residual so that we get the uh, estimator for, for variance, which is uh, very by i, right? So again, sigma square i, the estimate, we put a hat on top to, to know this is our estimator. An estimator for sigma square i is simply by using all or less residual. All or less residual u hat, u hat i. Square that residual is our you know, estimator for sigma square. I right. So once we have um, the estimate for uh, sigma square i, the, then afterwards our next step is uh, we can calculate y star x star. How do we calculate y star x star? Very simple. We use y divided by sigma i hat x similarly divided by sigma i hat. Right. So we got our y star x star right here. Sigma square uh, sigma. Sigma i hat is simply square root of this guy. Sigma sigma i hat is simply square root of this guy, right? So so you know if you want to do it manually, then from first step, once we have this uh, sigma uh, i square hat, you take square root so that uh, you got a number right here, so that you do you you, you can calculate y star x star so on so forth, right? Uh, but anyway, I showed you computer codes for computer for R Studio. Actually, once you once you calculate residual square, actually everything afterwards we give the computer. Let computer to take the square root. Computer to to apply to calculate y star, x star, wrong regression, everything afterwards. Right. So that uh, uh, again, if you want to do it manually, then you estimate residual square, calculate sigma i square hat, and afterwards that calculates your y star, x star, which is original y divided by sigma i hat, original x divided by original sigma i hat, right? And, so, and then run the regression, y star over x star, the corresponding coefficient beta hat, we call it beta hat GLS. This beta hat GLS will be efficient again, <laughs> efficient again. Why this GLS uh, be, will be efficient again? We proved up here because because once you apply the transformation, y divided by sigma i, x divided by sigma i. So the corresponding u star, which is u divided by sigma i, right? This u star actually satisfy assumption two again in the sense for the u star, the variance will be a constant one, right? Constant one. You know, it doesn't have to be one, but you know, as long as it's a constant, it satisfies assumption two, right? But right, right here, of course, a one. Is also a constant. It, you know, it's definitely satisfy our assumption too, right? That's why. That's why, as long as we divide by sigma i, so that our y star, x star corresponding u star, the u star will be nice again. Which, in the sense, uh, u star will be nice again in the sense u star satisfy our assumption too again. Beforewards, our our u i. Our UI violate our nice assumption sigma square, so that we call we are we are in the case of a hatter, right? That's why you know we call it UI is not nice. So that let's do a transformation. Transform U to be U star. U is a uh, U is not nice, which violate our assumption too, right? So that let's transform U into U star. Hopefully that. U star is nice again in the sense U star gonna satisfy assumption two again, right? That's basically the you know the the theory. So the computer codes, computer codes very simple. All or less, this is what we had before. Very simple. Um, the test BP test very simple. BP test parentheses all or less. All or less is simply our all or less reg regression, right? So we BP test all or less we can. 
we can perform a BP test right, to check out do we homo or heter, right? Are we homo or heter? Uh, by doing so, you need to load a package called LM test, linear model test. And um, the GLS, the computer code is, first of all, re all or less residual. If you square it, you got our, we call the U2. U2 is our sigma square i hat, right? Once we have uh, the U2 from the first step, afterwards, we can run a linear model by specified weights is one over U2. So that I simply give the computer give the computer such a weight. Computer afterwards, computer gonna calculate square root and then apply all those, you know, y divided by sigma i, x divided by sigma i, so on and so forth, and run a regression, y star or x star. Computer gonna do everything else uh, afterwards. For us, we simply, once we supply the weight sigma square i, which is a residual square, give a residual square to the computer, let computer know, the weight is one over U2. Computer gonna do everything else afterwards, right? So, oh, one over is uh, our theory. The theory is uh, everything divided by sigma i, right? So uh, that's the, where does the inverse come from, right? So basically, basically our uh, GLS could be viewed as a weighted regression, weighted least square in the sense the weight is one over sigma i, right? That's why computer basically calculate the square root and then apply the weight one over sigma i to y to x and then get our y star x star. All right, that's a quick review of uh, what we learned the last time. Uh, and uh, by the way, the uh, this is all or less not significant, but the GLS, GLS, we recover the efficiency again, right? See, for, for GLS, L and Y, see, it's a significant again, right? So that based on GLS, our conclusion is, uh, of course, uh, L and Y, your income, of course, uh, gonna affect your consumption, right? So that's the big deal of uh, GLS, basically, uh, very often, very often, I got a question from my students uh, when they when they do their dissertation. The question is uh, a common uh, question. You know, is uh, the student come to me and ask me, Professor? You know, I, I'm doing my dissertation now. All the coefficients, all the signs, positive, negative, all all of them make sense, but not significant, right? <laughs> then what should I do, right? And that's a typical question. Then very often my question, uh, my, my, my answer will be, did you check out GLS, right? <laughs> so you're not, you know, significant, could be because you violate assumption two or assumption three. We're gonna discuss assumption three in a second, right? But if you violate those assumptions, so then that could be the reason why you're not efficient, right? That's why, you know, in that case, if you are running into such a, such a case, then you can consider, you know, basically modify your standard error, try to make it efficient again, right? That's the solution. All right, now today, let's move on to assumption three. If you understand assumption two, and so today assumption three will be really, really easy to, because assumption three, uh, everything, will be similar, if not the same. Everything will be very, very similar to assumption two. In other words, I can tell you, you know, we're gonna do the th three issues again. Basically, issue number three, what if assumption three violated? Issue number two, how do we test? Issue number three, uh, how do we, uh, you know, recover the efficiency again, right? Uh, with the solution again, GLS. Basically, everything very, very similar, if not the same, must be very similar to assumption two. Assumption two, assumption three, they're really, really similar. So let's start. First of all, assumption three. Uh, originally, our assumption three is a U, I, U, J. Their covariance or correlation is a zero, right? So between index, different index, i and the j, u i and the u j, they, you know, they their correlation is zero. You can interpret all this assumption as covariance or correlation is a zero. We we showed their equivalence before. So those are 
if we use index i and j, then our individual are uh, over space. For example, we have 100 individual, 100 firms, 100 households, right? Think about in the situation that we are talking about different time. In time series, we're going to use a notation yt rather than yi. Uh, the very, very similar. You know, before words, i stand for individual. That's why, you know, we use index i. Now T stands for different time period. That's why we use that index T, but it's just a different index, right? Basically everything is still very similar to what we had before. But anyway, by using index T, now our assumption number three basically is uh, uh, UT and uh, US. S just, just means a different time period. UT and US, so their correlation is a zero, right? But basically, Basically, between different time period, UT and US for different time, they're, they're uncorrelated. Their correlation is zero, right? So, in a, for example, suppose T is uh, each year, then US, UT, their correlation is zero means, for example, the, the, the error term from different time, for example, from, from different year, for example, from 1991 and 1992, they're U, UTs, right? US, UT, they're uncorrelated. That's basically the simple assumption. So, so right here, uh, introduce a little jargon. Then we use index I, uh, so that similar, you know, in other words, when our data set is talking about, say, 100 firms, 100 individuals, or 50 states, Usually, we call your data set is a cross-sectional data set. If your time at index is T, you're talking about, for example, say, uh, 20 years, or, for example, 100 months, or maybe 300 days, uh, we call it time series data set because your, your data set over time, right? You're, so that's why your index is a little T. T could be year, could be months, could be days, or so on and so forth. But, but anyway, it's over time. So, so our uh, for time series data set, as our assumption three is clearly, be, you know, is uh, US, UT has a zero correlation, not correlated. And this assumption three, actually, let's further impose uh, another assumption, try to simplify assumption three a little bit. In other words, let's assume this UT follows such a, we call AR1 process. What's AR1? You know, we call the AR1 process. AR1, A, A stands for auto. Auto means itself. See, UT and UT, you know, both sides of uh, this equation, both sides, they are U, the variable U itself, right? That's why we call it auto. The R stands for regressive, regressive, because this equation looks like uh, as if a UT is a round trying to run a regression over u t minus one, right? That's why this uh this re, you know this um, equation we call it auto regressive. That's why we call it a r a r in short. What does the number one stand for? A r one process. One means right hand side we have only the first leg. In other words, we have the only t minus one. If uh, similarly, if you talk about the AR2 process, then right hand side we have uh, u t minus one and also u t minus two. In other words, in other words, if you talk about the AR1 process, for example, suppose u t is uh, uh, the year 1991, the the year t minus one must be in 1990, right? So if we assume u t follows such an AR1 process, we basically assume only last year affects this year, right? If you talk about uh, the case of that AR2 process, it means last year, end of the year, you know, before that, it means uh, 91 and 89, two years previously, you know, gonna affect this year, right? That's basically the idea, AR1, AR2, so on and so forth. But anyway, uh, you know, to make it simple, let's focus on AR1 process. Let's assume only last year affect this year, right? Only last year affect this year. So it's, 90, 91 affects 92, 92 affects 93, 93 affects 94, so on and so forth. Only, you know, so that uh, let's call it uh, AR1 process. That's a simple idea. So under, under this uh, AR1 process assumption, under this assumption, so that our assumption number three 
our assumption number three could be simplified to rho equals to zero. Let's see. If a rho is a zero, it means uh, last year doesn't affect this year at all, right? Because the between between you know over time, last year doesn't affect this year. Of course, uh, this year doesn't affect next year neither, right? So that if a rho is a really zero, then over time, over time, talk about the term ut, you know, there's no correlation at all, right? Over time, they have no relationship at all, right? That's why. That's why this assumption number three, assumption three, could be simplified to rho equals to zero, right? Again, we are talking about uh, uh, we further impose an AR1 process assumption, right? So that under under this AR1 process, the, our assumption three could be simplified to rho equals to zero, right? Of course, the opposite is rho is non-zero. For example, suppose rho is a 0.5, it means of last year multiplied by 0.5, so that affects this year, right? Similarly, rho could be negative, could be negative 0.5, right? It, it is last year multiplied by negative 0.5, you know, goes to this year, right? So, so those terminologies are, if rho is positive, we call it, uh, you know, positive autocorrelation. If the rho is negative, there is a negative auto kind of correlation, right? The intuition is, uh, for example, say, let me give a little example. Say, for example, say, uh, suppose you do grocery shopping every week, right? Suppose last week I, I bought a lot of foods, right? If I bought a lot of foods last week, then probably after a week, my refrigerator is still full, right? Then when I do grocery shopping this week, then maybe I just uh, buy a little bit, that's all, right? I, because I, I still have a lot of over from last week, right? So if you, you know, so if I buy a little bit this week, then next week, probably my refrigerator will be empty, right? So so that next week you're gonna buy a lot, right? So the high, low, high, low, it's a more like a negative correlation, right? If you last week you buy it a lot, high, then this week it will be low, right? If you buy low, then next week will be high. So it's a negative correlation. Uh, in that case, your number rho will be most likely, will be a negative number, right? And uh, other situations, positive autocorrelation could be something like, uh, if you do something uh, uh, good last time period, then this time period we we try to repeat. For example, it's something like uh, every year when you fill tax form, if uh, if you did something you know correctly, then you most likely you want to copy. You know, try to learn from from what you did last year, right? Try to continue, try to repeat what you did before. You remember you know what you did before, so that you try to continue, right? So basically, that's. Uh, that's an example of autocorrelation over time. Uh, if rho is a zero, it means last year, this year, you know, and next year, they're always uh, like a brand new. Last year doesn't affect this year at all. This year doesn't affect next year <laughs> neither, right? So zero correlation is more uh, a simple assumption, try to make the story easy. But is that really true in practice? Of course, no. We are human being, we have memories, right? We definitely remember what happened last year. If I made a mistake last year, I try to correct it, right? If I did something well last year, of course, I try to repeat it this year, right? So so most likely over time, last year gonna definitely affect this year, right? That's why assumption three, zero correlation is more uh, assumption, try to simplify our life rather than, you know, <laughs> in other words, we make the assumption three, we make the assumption zero correlation, not because, the, you know, it's it's correct, <laughs> just because, you know, it, under this assumption, our proof, our proofs will be easy, right? That's basically, I, you know, I'll show you more examples later on, most likely in reality, this assumption zero correlation will be affected. Uh, so short answer, what if uh, this assumption three violated, then what happens to our all of this beta hat? I'll tell you the conclusion you know, directly. The conclusion is uh, exactly the same as assumption two. And so uh, just like uh, assumption two, if assumption three is violated, our all of this beta hat will be 
still unbiased, still consistent, but inefficient. Why, why is that? You can check out your, you know, previous proof, right? Where did you use our assumption two, assumption three? Actually, when we derive variance of beta hat, we use both assumption two and three, right? So that, uh, so that uh, that's why assumption two and three, they're gonna affect our variance of beta hat, right? But, uh, but when we derive expectation of beta hat, actually we didn't use uh, assumption two or three. We only use assumption one or assumption four, right? That's why, that's why actually assumption two and three only affects our variance, which only affects our efficiency. That's intuition. So, you, you know, you don't have to do the proof again. Simply remember this conclusion. So that's issue number one we already introduced, right? Let's move on to issue number two. How do we test? How do we test? And so similarly, we can also learn the two ways, a quick graph way and also a formal test, right? A graph, let's, uh, let's do example, let's see. Uh, this is a, a example from Bataji's uh, textbook. They run the regression C over Y. C stands for consumption, Y stands for income. So that uh, this is all or less. This is all or less re regression. So residual analysis. Let's plot the graph first and talk. About. In this graph, you know, this is a residual you had over time, over year, over year again. You had over time beforeers for assumption two. For assumption two, the residual analysis is a U hat over Y hat, right? So we want to see if the variance is a constant. Right here, we want to plot a graph to see U hat over time. We want to see U hat over time if we have any pattern up and down, so 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 on so first. Because because we're trying to see different pattern assumption two. We trying to test, it's trying to see if the residual have the constant variation, right? Right here, we are testing. You know, we are trying to see you had if it is you know over time if there's any pattern up and down so forth. So this is a this is a corresponding residual analysis. So the the graph. So so the what we only emphasize is uh, when you plot residual analysis for assumption three, make sure you plot a graph over time over time if your time in your data set is year then it's a squiggle over over year if in your data set is over month then plot over months right if it's your day then plot over days okay let's directly introduce the formal test for for assumption three the test we still need our lm lm test package for assumption three we're gonna do a DW test. DW stands for durbin watson test, durbin watson test. And so, see assumption two, it's BP test, the brush bagain test, right? Assumption three is DW, durbin watson test. Their names are different, but uh, very interestingly, you know, they're all proposed by two persons that together. <laughs> BP test for assumption two, DW test for assumption three. Uh, before I introduce the details of a DW test, actually, we can already know how to interpret the results. <laughs> Interpreting the results, very similar. You know, basically the same way we learned, uh, just like any test, just like a t-test, f-test, uh, you know, whatever test. So once you have a test result, we can directly jump to the p-value. Now, the p-value is a uh, 6.5 e minus 11. E minus 11 means move the decimal to the left 11 digits, right? So, so that it means this number is a 0 0.0, there are many, many zeros, right? And then six, five, four, seven, right? It's definitely smaller than 0 0.05. So that our conclusion for the test will be, we're gonna reject now, right? Because our p-value less than 0 0.05. We reject now, then we need to have to figure out what's our H now, right? The H now for, for DW test is actually right here. The the H null for our test is very simple. Just uh, the value right here, rho, rho is zero. This is simply our H null. H null is uh, rho is a zero. 
rho is a zero. Rho is a zero means there's no autocorrelation over time. Last year doesn't affect this year. This year doesn't affect the next year, right? So H now, very simple. Rho is a zero. What's H1? The opposite. H1 is rho is non-zero, right? Rho is non-zero. So that uh, this is a H now, H1. Usually, H now will be a simple, is a nice case, right? For example, for, for, for uh, a, assumption number two, H now is a nice homo case, right? The variance is constant. For assumption three, our H now is a uh, row is a zero. There is no autocorrelation over time, right? So H now is usually a nice simple case, right? So let's go back to our example. So we reject the now. It means our H now is rho is a zero, right? We reject the now so that we go to H1 our row is non-zero, right? It means the last year really affects this year. Over time, there is autocorrelation, right? Our assumption three violated, so that our OLS is not efficient anymore, right? <laughs> so so this is, uh, you know, exactly the very, very, very similar to our assumption two, right? That's why I told you, if you learned assumption two well, assumption three will be really, really similar, really simple to you, right? So. That's assumption. Uh, that's uh, uh, that's the test. We learned uh, the test already. So, what shall we do if we find out assumption three has been violated? What's the solution? Issue number three, right? Issue number three. How do we recover the truth? The solution is again. It's called GLS. We're gonna do a transformation. Transform our error term U to be U star. Right before words, U is 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 not nice. It violate our assumption. Right now we're gonna do a transformation, transform bad error term to be U star again. Hopefully U star will be nice again. Right, that's basically the idea. So let's figure out what's the transformation so that after the transformation U star will be nice again. The transformation actually, transformation is a really really simple right here. Our transformation y star, x star, the transformation right here is a yt minus rho yt minus one. This is a transformation for assumption three. Before for assumption two, our, you know, we, similarly, we do a transformation. We get all y star, x star. At that time, for, for assumption two, y star is y divided by sigma i, right? That's what heteroscasticity. Now for autocorrelation, for assumption three, our transformation is yt minus rho yt minus one. This is our transformation, you know, for y star. Similarly, x star is xt minus rho xt minus one. So the similarly, u star is ut minus rho times a ut minus one. This is a transformation to get our u star. So where does this transformation come from? Why we do such a trans transformation? Actually, really, really simple. Let's take a closer look. After the transformation, u star is ut minus rho ut minus one, right? Let's take a closer look, what's this? And actually, let's go back to our AR1 process equation. ut minus rho ut minus one, right? In other words, if you move this term to the left-hand side, if you move this term to the left-hand side, then ut minus rho ut minus one, the difference will be epsilon t, right? In other words, we're trying to say, we're trying to say this u star is exactly our epsilon t, right? Epsilon t is epsilon t is right here, right? So, so you know why we figure out this kind of transformation? Before words, ut is over time is correlated. For example, last time period affects this time period, right? UT is bad. UT violate assumption three. For UT, last year, this year, there's always autocorrelation, right? But epsilon T, we assume it's a, it's a random noise. <laughs> you know, over time, there's no correlation at all. That's why you do the question. Uh, right, epsilon T is a, you're right. Uh, for example, what's a random noise? Random noise means, you know, 
Random. <laughs> Random in the sense uh, over different time. This the first year, second year, there's always a random number so that over time there's no auto, there's no correlation at all. Right. That's why we do this kind of transformation. We transform UT into epsilon T. Before UT, there's correlation, right? Over time. But epsilon T is is nice again. Epsilon T is totally random. Hence up this year, next year, you know, there's no auto correlation at all. Right. That's why we figure out this kind of transformation. So let's finish this uh the steps, the transformation. So we're gonna do uh skip step one for a second. You know, step two is we calculate y star and x star. What's y star and x star? Y star is a yt minus rho yt minus one. X star is xt minus rho t minus t, x t minus one, right? So we calculate our x star and y star. Once we have y star, x star, we're gonna run a regression y star over x star so that we calculate coefficient beta hat. Beta hat we call the GLS, right? So if you realize basically step two, step three, they are basically really, really similar or even identical to our uh, assumption to, to the homo heteroscedicity, right? <laughs> At that time, when we reviewed, it's exactly do a transformation, calculate Y star, X star, and exactly run a regression Y star over X star to get to the beta hat, right? <laughs> but of course, so the only difference is right here is uh, when we calculate Y star, X star, the transformation will be different, right? Right here, Right here, you know, since we need the row to do the transformation, so that our step number one, we need to calculate something called the row hat, right? Because for the true value row, we never know. We have to estimate the value row, right? How do we calculate the row? Very simple. We run the regression u hat, u hat t over u hat t minus one to calculate the row. In other words, again, Again, we go back to this equation, right? If we know ut, if we know ut minus one, we can simply run the regression ut over, you know, it's lag last year, right? To calculate the row hat, right? Since uh, since we don't know the true value of ut and the true value of uh, ut minus one, what shall we do? We replace the two by all or less residuals. In other words, we run the all or less regression to calculate, you know, you had t, right? We we calculate all of us residuals, right? And then from the from the re residuals, we run the regression residuals over its lag. Lag means uh, last year, right? So that once we once we find all of us re residual, so that we run the regression, you know, plug in replace u t and u t minus one by u t hat. U T minus one hat. U T hat and U T minus they are residuals from uh, all of this, right? So that's basically the the procedure. How do we calculate the row? Uh, we we use all of this re residuals. So run the regression over its uh, its leg last year, right? To find out uh, something called the row hat. Once we have a row hat, so that we can do the transformation to get our y star, x star, and then run regression y star over x star get beta hat. Uh, any questions uh, for the for the GLS uh, transformation? So that's that's our that's our GLS transformation. That's our GLS transformation. So everything is so similar except uh, the step number one, right? Still remember for for heteroscedasticity, step number one is we have to si estimate sigma. I square hat, right? So that afterwards, stand number two is our transformation. Y star is Y divided by sigma I, right? And the whole X star is similarly, you know, X divided by, you know, correspondingly. So that eventually we run regression Y, y star or X star, right? Right here for assumption three, the, again, we're gonna do a transformation Y star, X star, but the transformation will be different. Now we do this kind of transformation, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, so that so that we need the row hat to do the transformation right here. How do we get a row hat? We run we run the regression u u hat t over u hat t minus one to get the row hat. Right. Um, some jargons. The transformation right here. The transformation y star. The transformation right here. 
we have a terminology. We call it, uh, where is it? Cochrane Orcas transformation. Where it, uh, where's my, where's my terminology? I'll find uh, the terminology for you in point. Uh, anyway, let's show, let's show uh, computer codes for uh, GLS. For assumption three, for assumption three, the GLS, the computer codes will be different from assumption two. Assumption two, when we do uh, GLS transformation for heteroscedasticity, we still use LM commands, but by specify weights. Weight is one over one divided by U2, right? But for assumption three, computer codes will be totally different. Let me show you. First of all, we use a package called NLME. NLME stands for nonlinear mix effect. So that our command is called GLS. Recall, beforewards, for assumption two, our GLS command is linear model. We still use LN commands for assumption two, right? This is for assumption two. But for assumption three, now the command is just called GLS. For, for time series, for assumption three, the command is just called GLS. The GLS, C over Y, this is our, you know, over Y over X variable, the consumption over income, right? Everything afterwards, you, you can just uh, copy and paste my, my codes to the mimic. Let me explain a little bit. Let me let me run the regression and then explain the, the detail. So this option, this option correlation equals to C A C O R L one parenthesis. When you do your regression, you can just copy and paste on my my option right here. This part just means from talking about my error term. We are we are using a R one process. We're gonna estimate the row head, right? Second one, method equals the double quotes ML, which is uh, the method to calculate your row hat, method to, to calculate row hat. There's more than one options available. So the textbook use a uh, uh, maximum likelihood estimator for, for our row hat. So that right here, we are trying to replicate the textbook example. That's why we stand for double quotes ML. So there's also other methods available. So, but anyway. We try to replicate text book example. So let's check out the result right here. Um, AR1, uh, right here. We call it a row. Uh, our, the computer call it a phi, but anyway, the same number. This number is our row hat, 0 0.788, which is definitely non zero, right? <laughs> right here. This number, the number row is always the number between zero and one in terms of absolute value, right? In, in other words, could it be positive, could it be negative, right? So right here, the number is a positive 0 0.788, which is, uh, you know, very close to positive one side, right? And so it means uh, for our data set, we have very positive autocorrelation over time. And um, our... Uh, our regression result, intercept and the regression result right here. Uh, you know, right here, it's a significant p-value of 0 0.000. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you uh, uh, some, some, something in detail. At the first moment when you see the result, it might be a little bit counterintuitive to you, but I'm gonna show you the reason why. And so what's counterintuitive? Right here, recall the theory. The theory says, uh, what's the benefit of GLS? Uh, the GLS, the reason why we do this kind of transformation to do the GLS is that beforewards, all of less is may not be significant, right? It's in inefficient. In other words, all of less variance might be too large, right? That's why we do a GLS transformation. So that after trans GLS transformation, GLS, the variance or standard error is supposed to be smaller, right? So that you know, over GLS will be efficient again. So from theory, all or less variance might be large. GLS, the variance will be smaller, right? That's the theory. That's exactly what we saw from uh, assumption two, the heteroscedasticity. So that we would expect to see all or less may not be significant, but GLS, we recover the truth. We recover the efficiency again, right? In other words, again, GLS, again, standard error, supposed to be smaller, right? So 
uh, let me show you uh, something too. Uh, 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 actually, let's start. Let's keep it right here. So let's check out OLLS for assumption three. OLLS standard error is a 0 0.008. This is OLLS. This is OLLS. Recall from theory, well, GLS standard error is supposed to be even smaller, right? Let's check out GLS. Again, all or less 0, 0, 0.008, 0 0.008, right? Let's check out GLS. GLS, actually, it's bigger, right? The theory says GLS stand error is supposed to be smaller. But right here, it's counterintuitive in the sense we find out GLS, the variance or standard error, actually bigger than all or less, right? That's the part I, you know, I mentioned is con counterintuitive at the first moment, right? So, so you may wonder why. The theory says GOS supposed to reduce the standard error. But right here is counterintuitive. Our GOS right here actually is bigger than all of this, right? Why? <laughs> so to uh, uh, yeah, p-value still less than 0 0.05, right? Before words, all of this, all of us, it's a really, really small, right? <laughs> the GOS also, also lesser than 0 0.05, okay? Right? So, but anyway, let me give you some uh, uh, jargons, some uh, theoretical uh, terminology to answer the question, why in this key example, our GOS stand there, why, you know, not even smaller, right? Let me, let me introduce some uh, terminology. The terminologies I want to introduce will be something called true GOS and a feasible GOS. Let's introduce a jargon. And, and once we introduce jargon, we're going to come back to the, the example to explain why it's counterintuitive. So the idea true GOS and a feasible GOS, what they are? Very simple. True GOS. True GLS will be the GLS regression by using, for example, the true value of, uh, say, rho. If you use a true value of rho to do the to do the GLS transformation to get your y star x star, right, to do the tr transformation, then the solution is called a true GLS. Of course, the true value we never know, right? How do we supposed to know the true value? That's why in practice we do a step, step number one, to calculate something called row hat, right? See, then there's a theory. You know, in your, in your transformation, if you use a true value right here, if you use a true value row, then the corresponding GOS will be called a true GOS, right? Again, we just mentioned the, the true value row, we never know, right? That's why in practice, we calculate row hat instead, right? So, so if you calculate row hat, the corresponding GOS is called feasible GOS. Feasible GOS. Right here. The true GOS use a true value of row, and the feasible GOS use a row hat. That's the terminology. Feasible GOS use a row hat. In other words, in other words, true GLS only exists in theory. It, you know, in practice, it's infeasible. True GLS is infeasible. Infeasible means that, you know, we cannot do that in practice, right? Because we never know the, the, the true value, right? So in practice, what we can do is only feasible GLS, right? We have to calculate the raw hat so that to make it feasible, right? So that's the terminology, you know, true GOS and a feasible GOS. Let's further, you know, let's further talk about, uh, do some comparison. Let's compare true GOS and all or less, which one is better? True GOS and all or less, which one is better? First of all, I'll say true GOS is always better than all or less. Actually, always better or at least the same. Why? Or in what case true GLS is better than all of this? What case uh, true GLS is the same? Very simple. Go back to our, for example, suppose we are talking about uh, assumption number three, right? 
we are talking about uh, something three right here. For example, say, if the value of a row is non-zero, right? If the value of row is non-zero, as we learned before, then all of this is not efficient, right? Our GLS, if you use a true value of row to do the GLS transformation, true GLS will be efficient so that, so that true GLS will be more efficient than all of this, right? If a row is non-zero, right? In what kind of situation, you know, they two are the same? Very simple. If a row turns, happens to be zero, if a row happens to be zero, then the transformation, let's take a closer look at the transformation. If a row is exactly zero, then the transformation, if you plug in zero right here, y star basically reduces to y, right? x star also reduces to x, right? So if your row happens to be zero, then y star, y star reduces to y, and the x star reduces to, to, to x, right? So that your true GLS reduces to all of s if a row happens to be zero, right? So in other words, if a row is exactly zero, if you're lucky, if there's no autocorrelation at all, then all of s and the true GLS, they happens to be exactly the same, right? So, so, so that's the two cases. Let's summarize. If a row is a zero, then true GLS is exactly the same as all of S, right? True GLS reduces to, to all of S, right? They two are the same. That's the case if a row is a zero. First case, right? Second case, if a row is non-zero, then our true GLS after GLS transformation, true GLS will be efficient, but all of S not efficient, right? <laughs> that in the second case, if a row is non-zero, then true GLS will be more efficient than all of S, right? Then, in a second, then to summarize, true GLS will be either the same or more efficient than all of S, right? Either the same or more efficient than all of S, right? Question? <laughs> Now we're talking about uh, the transformation by using true value row, true value row. <laughs> That's why it's a true GIS. <laughs> so again, so far we just had pointed out true GIS will be either the same or more efficient than all of us, right? So that's why, first of all, you know, although before we were saying, we were, you know, we were saying GIS is more efficient, but keep in mind, we were talking about the true GLS, right? True GLS will be more efficient than all of us, right? How about feasible GLS? Let's see. So, so far we pointed out true GLS is better than all of us, right? And, uh, and uh, where is it? This next one. The feasible GLS, how do we compare feasible GLS versus all of us? Actually, right here is kind of hard to, to compare the two directly, right? Because we only know the property between true GLS and all of us. Now, now, if you want to compare if you want to compare feasible all or less and all or less, feasible GLS and all or less, right here, basically, it depends on the property of your row hat. If your row hat is really, really close to the true value row, then basically your feasible GLS basically is the same as true GLS, so that your feasible GLS shares the property of true GLS, so that your feasible GLS will be better than all or less, right? That's the conclusion. If your row hat is close to the true value row, right? So that your feasible GS basically is the same as true GS, so that your feasible GS will be better than all of us, right? What if your row hat is far away from the true value row? Uh, so we don't know, right? So it could be really bad if your, if your row hat is really off. If your row head is far away from the true value row, then of course we cannot guarantee 
your fees about your ass, uh, you know, still better than all. No, we, we cannot conclude that anymore, right? So, so, so the nice conclusion, GLS, a feasible GLS better than all of us, has to be under the, you know, under the property. Your row hat is close to the true value of row, right? If your true value, of, you know, row hat is close to the true value of row, then your feasible GLS, basically close to the feasible uh, as a true, true, feasible GS close to true, true, true GS, true GS better than all of us, so that we can con conclude, okay, your feasible GS better than all of us, right? That's the conclusion again, has to be under the assumption row hat close to true row, right? What if your row hat far away from the true row? Uh, actually, we don't know. Your feasible GS could be even worse than all of us, right? <laughs> so that's the reason why. In our computer example just now, we find out that actually our feasible GLS actually has a bigger standard error than all of us, right? The short answer is uh, actually in this in that example, your row hat probably far away from the true row. Why? Again, in this example, I, I'm trying to say you know trying to show to say. In this example, why the standard error right here is larger than all of us? Most likely, the row head right here, you know, is far away from the true row, right? Why this row head is not very good? Very simple. Let me show you the sample size. The degree freedom right here is only 44. This is our n minus k. In other words, our sample size right here is only 40 something, 46 states. Our sample size is really, really small. That's why, that's why in this a small sample example, our property of row hat, you know, is not that close to the true value row, right? <laughs> if our row hat is not very good, then the corresponding GOS, the feasible GOS, may not be close to the true GOS, may not be better than all of us anymore, right? <laughs> That's the reason why. That's the reason why textbook purposely pick this kind of example. Pick an example that your GLS, your feasible GLS, you know, <laughs> the corresponding standard error actually larger than all of us, right? It's not a mistake. It's, a, you know, textbook purposely show you this kind of situation could happen in, in practice. Is, you know, when do we see this kind of example? If your sample size is small so that your row head is 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 off is too far from the true value row right uh for assumption two actually similar stuff could could, could also happen for example when do those uh, autocorrelate uh, do those homo hetero heteroscedasticity issue similarly if your sample size is small then your sigma i square hat similarly again could be far away from the true value sigma i square right so that the corresponding gos again you know, your feasible GOS could, you know, will be far away from the true GOS. Your feasible GOS will be, you know, could produce a bigger variance than all of us, right? That's basically the idea. So right here, go back to the theory. Go back to the theory. Let's read the example. True GOS use a true value or row. Feasible GOS use a row hat. And so that true GOS is always better than all or less, always better than all or less, or at least the same, right? If a row, if the true value row happens to be zero, right? So that if you ask me to compare, you know, true GLS versus all or less, I know the, I know, you know, which one is better, right? But in practice, we are always comparing feasible GLS and all or less, right? Then if you want to compare the two, then depends on your feasible GLS, how close feasible GS to the true GS, right? So hopefully, the, you know, your row head is close to the true value row, right? Your 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 sigma i square head is close to the true value sigma i square, right? So that's basically the discussion. In practice, in practice, because a small sample, your row head could be really off, right? So that your feasible GS could be could be even worse than all of us. That's the discussion. Uh, any questions so far about the, see the assumption three, everything, 
almost uh, the same, you know, <laughs> the two or something too, right? The three issues. And so, uh, a little detail. Just now I showed you a uh, Durbin Watson test. But uh, what's this, uh, the details of this? Uh, I'll show you very quickly. This is not required, but uh, just for learner purpose. How how uh, how do we calculate the Durbin Watson test? Durbin Watson, they calculate such a value, DW value. Of course, uh, DW <laughs> come from their name, right? DW value is uh, from this kind of a number. The difference between ut, ut minus one, difference square and then summation divided by ut square. And this number actually very simple. The top denominator, if you expand it, it's a minus b square, right? A minus b square. Of course, very simple. We, we know we can expand in three terms, a square plus b square minus two ab, right? That's why we have three terms. See, the first one, a square plus b square minus two AB, right? That's where the three terms come from. So that under the null, under the null, if rho is really zero, if over different time periods, if there's really no autocorrelation, under the null, then this guy basically reduces to zero. It's because UT, UT minus one, their you know, covariance basically zero, right? So under H null, the third term basically is zero. How about the first two terms? The first term, if you take a closer, ut square, ut square, exactly. The only difference is uh, that the, the bottom is summation from one to t. You say you u1 square, u2 square, u3 square, and two ut square, right? On top, this is uh, from the second time period to t. So only differs by u1, only short of one term, right? In other words, uh, if t is large, then this is basically the same, only short of one term. So that's why, the ratio right here, almost one, right? Almost one. The second term also similarly, you know, if you plug in t uh, from two to t, you know, if you plug in two, two minus one, that's u one square, right? So, you know, if you plug in capital T, capital T minus one square, right? So basically sh only short of the very last time period, right? So that, so that compared to the second term, second term, the ratio is also almost one. What I'm trying to show is right here. You know, the first term is on top, we, we short of u1 square. The, the, you know, the bottom, we have u, u1 square, u2 square, u3 square, and two, u capital T square, right? On top, we are short of the very first one, right? So that uh, their ratio almost one. The second term, you know, similarly, we short of the very last one. So the ratio again, almost one, almost one. So under the null, under H null. And so this is basically one. This is basically one. This is basically zero. So under the null, DW value basically equals to two, right? So that so that if a computer give you value, you know, DW value close to two, that's a signal basically you know, H now basically is true. Our row is really zero, right? You know, if our DW value is different from, far away from two, goes to, you know, so left hand side, right hand side, so that it's a signal probably, you know, we violate our H now, right? You can show that very easily. This DW value, you know, DW value centered at two, centered at a two, the, the had a boundary as a, must be between zero and a four. It's very easy to, to show because this term, this term must be smaller than the summation of the first two, right? So that uh, there must be, you know, boundary at zero. So similarly, you know, also the other side boundary at four. So it's very, very similar to a T test. The T test from negative infinity to positive infinity right here is from zero to four, uh, centered at two, right? But uh, intuition is exactly the same. If I were, if I were Durbin or Worsen, if I invented this test, I would simply suggest to, to their value minus two so that correct number to be centered to be zero again, right? So that I can I can scale their number so that, it, you know, change their value to be negative two to positive two, so centered at a two, <laughs> centered at a zero again, right? But anyway, they, they didn't do that, but... Uh, 
So, so that, uh, for, for example, if you check out our computer result, our DW value, in our case, 0 0.46, recall again, DW value between 0 and 4, right? This number is kind of close to the 0 sign, right? <laughs> so that is a signal probably violate our H0, right? If our DW H now is is true, right? Right here is a it's kind of far away from two. It goes to the zero side, right? So you know that's a signal we we reject and now. But anyway, we always jump to the p value to check out if this uh, larger or smaller is than zero point zero five to, to figure this out. Um, One more detail. Uh, this little session subsection, I put a star. I put a star means that this is optional, just for learner purpose. This part I'm trying to trying to show matrix notation because uh, later on, if you especially for graduate students, I uh, may read some textbooks, some uh, journal articles. Many of them they use a uh, matrix notation. Matrix notation is nothing fancy. Just uh, try to simplify proofs, but intuition exactly the same. So right here, I just want to show you why we use matrix notation. Matrix, you, by using matrix notation, Y will be a column of uh, those Ys. For example, Y1, Y2, Y3, and two Yn. X is a N by K matrix. For example, the first column will be constant and education for, for first person, second person, third person until very last one. And uh, experience for first person, second person until the very last person, so on first. So that our X will be N by K matrix. So our beta in matrix notation, it's a K by one, K by one vector. So it's a combination alpha, beta one, beta two. So it's a, a combination. That's why it's a three by one vector, K by one vector. Our error term, it's U1, U2, U3, and UN. It's a UN by one matrix. By using this kind of matrix notation, our, our, uh, our assumptions, assumption number one, assumption number two, assumption number three, these three assumptions could be simplified into this. Assumption one says UI is a zero. By using the matrix notation, now U is a is a column of a U UIs, right? U1, U2, U3, U4. So under you know under assumption number one, the column of the, those uh, U the vector notation, it's uh, the expectation will be a column of zeros, zero, 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 right? So under assumption one, the vector UI will be a you know, will be zero again. A column a vector will be zero. Assumption two says UI square is a zero. This is a variance of UI. So let's check out by using matrix notation, variance of the vector U will be diagonal wise. Those are variance of U1, variance of U2, variance of U3, and two variance of U, UN. So on diagonal wise, those are variances. Off diagonals, those are U1, U2, U1, U3, so on so forth, until U1, UN. So, so, so off diagonals, so those are all covariances between different, uh, you know, uh, I and J. So let's see. Assumption two says, diagonal wise, those are all sigma square. Diagonal wise, so those are all sigma squares. Sigma square, sigma squares, sigma square. Off diagonal wise, assumption three says, they're all zeros. There is all every everything off diagonal. There is zero. So under assumption two and three, it simply says the variance of error term in a matrix notation. It's sigma sigma square on diagonal, and the zero on off diagonal. So that this could be rewritten if you put sigma square outside the notation, right? It's one 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 on diagonal, right? This is simply identity matrix of dimension n, right? So. Under assumption two and three, our variance of error term is simply sigma square times identity matrix, right? So that's why by using matrix notation, our error term, you know, has a zero mean 
and the variance sigma squared times another matrix. That's the nice way by using matrix notation, because by using matrix notation, our assumption one, two, three, all three together could be written into error term U in matrix notation has a zero mean and a variance of sigma square I. That's all. That's the nice part about uh, those assumptions, you know, by using matrix notation. That's why, that's why assumption two and three, they're so similar because both of them, they're trying to say, you know, they two together, they two the, under assumption two and three, they two together make our variance to be so such a nice sigma square times identity matrix, right? If one of them violated, for example, if assumption two violated, it means diagonal wise, those are not nice constant term anymore, right? <laughs> so that they're not the same sigma square, sigma squares anymore. Assumption three says off diagonal terms, those are all zeros. If this is not true anymore, then the variance matrix is not as nice identity matrix anymore, right? So that's the simple you know, idea. So in general, no matter assumption two or three violated, it simply says the variance is not such a nice form anymore. So that you have to calculate the, the variance matrix for this error term. If you call it the omega, you have to calculate omega so that you have to multiply in matrix notation, you do a GLS transformation. In general, if if diagonal wise, diagonal wise, if those are not the same number, then correct the diagonal, so calculate the number. If off diagonal wise, if those are not a zero anymore, calculate the off diagonal numbers so that you plug in. So in general, if either assumption two or assumption three violated, you have to estimate this general form of uh, variance matrix. Right, if you call it omega, and then do a transformation afterwards. This is a GLS estimator in matrix notation in general. That's why assumption two and three they're they're so similar to each other because both of them they're talking about over variance of omega is a sigma square i, right? <laughs> so the other details I will leave the detail to interest readers. I won't put these to to into our exam. Uh, they're just uh, trying to show this matrix notation can simplify our assumption a, a, a lot. That's why so far assumption number one, two, three, we already finished uh, these three assumptions. Assumption number one just says error term has a zero mean. Assumption two and three says variance has a nice variance, sigma square times i, right? So we've already finished on assumption one, two, three. We're gonna finish. Uh, we're gonna do assumption number four afterwards. Let's take a ten minutes break.